let's uh, bow our heads as we invite the presence of the Lord to be with us as we present. Father God, we thank you that you are God. And that because your name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who would provide, you are our all in all. And we just want to thank you that because of your goodness, we are here. And so as we present, we ask, Lord, that the message of healing and wholeness that you have for us will be evident. And that we will go away with something tangible to share with others and further enhance our faith and trust and confidence in you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, when it comes to faith and healing, there are many questions, aren't there? Many complexities. And often you'll find that in our churches, there may be polarized views. Some people believing that all we need is faith in Jesus, yes? And others thinking that, yes, faith is in the background, but you need the doctors. You go to them first. But when we're sick, James 5.15 tells us something clearly, doesn't it? Is there any sick amongst you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Anoint with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus and the, the prayer of faith will save the sick. So we're going to talk about some of that. But before I go on, I'd like to introduce to you my co-presenters. We have Dr. Christopher Levy, who you'll hear from a little later. He's an emergency physician. And I'm glad to be sharing the podium with you, Dr. Levy. We also have Pastor Michael Hamilton from the Trans-European Division. If you'd like to stand... <laughs> this is Pastor Hamilton, this is uh, Dr. Levy. And uh, Pastor Hamilton wears a number of hats. He's the Sabbath School Director. He's prayer ministries, spiritual formation, uh, literature, and uh, personal ministries, an Associate uh, Director for Personal Ministries. So, welcome. Now, I'd like to start by just giving a brief overview. If you'll see, you'll see an outline of the program um, in terms of how the workshop will go. We're going to be looking at a general overview to start with, how we balance the perspective. So just give a little insight about how the workshop will run. And then we're going to ask Dr. Levy to present on faith, examining faith from a clinician's point of view. We have many doctors and health professionals in our churches, don't we? We need to value their contribution, so that's why Dr. Levy is here. Then we're going to look at some uh, case studies. We're going to uh, have some analysis of some real-life scenarios because it's good to have some presentations from the front, isn't it? But what does it mean in real life when you go back to your churches? What are some of the experiences that we need to analyze? We're going to look at that. And then we're going to uh, have a break. And then when we come back, we're going to look at dealing with extremes in our congregation. You heard some earlier on in the plenary session, people who feel that we should just have health, natural remedies, and that's all, or those who feel that the scientific method is the way to go. So we're going to look at how we balance the extremes in our church and some guidelines to safeguard the membership. Yes, because you've heard of people coming to the church and saying, I have this wonderful liquid in this bottle. It will heal everything. Yes, have you heard those people come to our churches? or somebody who puts on a program, and when they present, they give a lot of evidence that's not scientific. How do we deal with the extremes in our churches, and how do we set guidelines? Would you like to know how to do some of that? We're going to do that after the break. Then a little later on, we're going to look at examining faith from a pastoral perspective. What are some of the things the ministers need help with when they're ministering to the sick? Are they working closely with health professionals? Uh, Pastor uh, Michael Hamilton is going to give us some special insight as well on anointing service. Can I see those, the hands of those of you who's had an anointing service? Who's been involved with an anointing service? Well, you're going to hear some things today which is going to be very interesting. You might look at anointing differently afterwards. So a lot of key perspectives. Then as we go through, I need you to think about the health professionals in your church and when you're ministering to them, what are some of the things you wish you had known? Also, if there is an effective way that you have found to deal with people who are difficult, who have our extreme views. So those are some of the things. We're hoping you'll stay with us for the duration and we'll be inviting your questions. So balancing perspectives on faith and health. 
and healing. We've just talked a little bit uh, about what we're going to be doing. Now, I think a good place to start, when we're talking about faith and healing, the first thing to do is to establish what is faith. Can I hear from you, your, what do you think faith is? Any, any explanatory um, sentences? What is faith? Trust, confidence. Well, I've taken the Oxford Dictionary, which is just a broad uh, explanatory uh, or explanation of faith. We're going to hear a clinician's explanation and a pastoral explanation. But faith is complete trust or confidence in something or someone. That's the Oxford Dictionary. Or a strong belief in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual conviction rather than proof. That's what faith is according to the Oxford Dictionary. But do you know in our health establishments and healthcare training, individuals are realizing that it's important to embrace the spiritual aspect of care. So whereas before, if you were a nurse or a doctor, you'd be reprimanded for sharing your faith, currently, research is saying that we need to acknowledge the impact of faith and healness on the experience of a patient. So in 2010, I received an invitation from the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, where I'm from. Um, the National Health Service is the main body that regulates health and delivers health care. And one day I received a telephone call from one of the executives saying, for the very first time in the United Kingdom, we are going to do a conference on the impact of faith and religion on mental health. This is the first time ever there was going to be a conference in the NHS looking at does religion impact our faith, uh, just health or faith, religion rather, or our faith, or our beliefs, does it impact our health and does it have an outcome in terms of Melton health? And when they invited me to speak, they said, you know, when we thought of this topic, we decided to go to the Seventh-day Adventist church because we feel we can learn from them. This is England, who are very, very specialized, and, and uh, they look to science a lot. And they came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church for us to have an input in the very, very first conference on examining religion and faith and its impact on mental health. Do you think that's a good thing? Yes? For them to come to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So off I went, and we looked at some of the research that talks about how faith positively impacts our health. The Mental Health Foundation has done a research looking at the positive things about health and our beliefs, our religious beliefs, and how it impacts our health. And this is what they found. They found that people who have a faith, uh, it engenders a sense of belonging. Do you feel that you belong in your church? Yes? When you have an illness... The um, health ministries department and the community services, they come and visit you in hospital, don't they? They pray for you. And so the researchers found that when you have a faith and you're ill, you're not left alone. There's a sense of belonging to God first and then to your community. They also found that it induces self-confidence. Can you imagine if you have an illness that can diminish, make you feel diminished in some way. But when you have a faith, science is showing that when you believe in God and you have a supportive church community, it enhances your self-confidence. That's good news, isn't it? It also shows that some mental health sufferers report less stigma in their faith communities. So for somebody who has a mental health issue and they don't belong to a church, they feel more sti uh, stigmatized than if they believe in God and they have a supportive faith. Can, is that true of your congregation for people with mental health illness? Do they feel less stigmatized in your churches? I hope they do. Then it says belonging to a faith group offers personal support. That's what our community services is about, our deacon and deaconesses and health ministries. We give each other personal support when we go through illnesses. The Research Foundation also found that people who have faith, their church provides a network for ongoing connection and support. That's like the Good Samaritan, looking after those who are wounded, being it physical, emotional, spiritual. It also enhances the rehabilitation process. Imagine having a lifelong illness and you're sitting at home alone. That's very disconnected. But when you belong to a faith group and you have faith in God, 
It enhances your rehabilitation. In other words, the researchers have found that people recover quicker when they have a faith in God. Isn't that amazing? That's encouraging. It also nurtures spiritual development. You heard today in the Adventist Lifestyle Study about the resilience that the faith gives us. And so this enables our strength and confidence in God to increase because we know he's there for us. It also encourages uh, emotional and mental healing. Again, you don't feel that because you have a physical illness, everything is gone. Your emotion and spiritual well-being is nurtured when you have a faith in your healing community. And your belief in God is strengthened as other aspects of their life. Now, we know that as a church community, but I think it's excellent that researchers looking on have a finding that Christians have an edge when they're ill, when they suffer sickness. These are the advantages we have because of our faith. Isn't that exciting that the world is coming to know that? Now, in the United Kingdom, we have a newspaper called the Daily Mail, and um, they uh, in 2007, a uh, research went out in this general national newspaper and it asked the question, do you want to live longer? And it gave several um, descriptors of what helps you to live longer and live well in health. And some of them was exercise and eating well. And one of them was going to church. In fact, the other research says if you want to be Live longer, another Daily Mail article says, become a Seventh-day Adventist. Can you imagine that? The world is looking on and saying that we can live longer because of our health. And what they found was that faith, going to church regularly, practicing your faith, had a longer life expectancy uh, when they looked at the study. It was the University of Pittsburgh. They looked at individuals who were ill who had high cholesterol and who were on statins and various drugs, and they compared the efficacy of that medication to somebody who was ill and going to church regularly and had a faith. And they found that the outcomes for the regular churchgoer and those who believed and had a faith were superior. Isn't that exciting? Faith does work, doesn't it? Okay. Now, we've had some various studies that looked at how faith actually impacts physiologically, emotionally, and spiritually. And some research was done to look at physiological changes in the body when we engage in an act of worship, when we pray, when we sing, when we have a worship service, when we have a quiet meditative moment. And a study was undertaken at Duke University and they looked at two groups. They had a control group, those who didn't pray and those who prayed or those who were ill, who had uh, uh, high blood pressure, and uh, those who had a group praying for them and those who didn't have a group praying for them. And it's important when you do research studies to have a control group, so it's a comparative study. And what the Duke researchers found that after uh, a period of time, they did six weeks, 12 weeks, and then six months, they followed those with high blood pressure who were being prayed for and those who had hypertension and who were not being prayed for. And at the end of the duration, they, they found that those who were prayed for, it actually lowered their blood pressure. So can we say prayer works in this, in this research? We may say yes. We'll see some other discussions later on. So that was one study that showed the effectiveness and the efficacy of faith and prayer. And we know that when you pray, You've spoken with people who are unwell and they're being prayed for. They always share a sense of how uplifted they feel after the prayer, don't they? Because there is some connection there. And very often we think of prayer as just something we do morning, noon, and night. But if you think about it, when you actually pray, you're communicating with the God of heaven. It's like the heavenly audience stands to attention when you call God's name in prayer. That is powerful, isn't it? You're connecting to a source of power. Now, the Duke University also looked at cardiac patients who were recovering from heart surgery. And uh, they were looking at those who had to have a stent put in uh, because of uh, cardiovascular disease. And the, U the Duke University sh study showed that cardiac patients receiving intercessory prayer in addition to their stenting appeared to recover much better than those um, who just received coronary stenting alone. So again, two groups, 
One group of cardiovascular patients just had a stent put in to enlarge the vessels and to create a, a better efficacy in their cardiovascular output. And another group who had a cardio, uh, the stent put in, but they were also prayed for. The group who received prayer had better outcomes. Are we surprised? No, the power of prayer again. So another study with Dr. William uh, Harris and his colleagues, they again looked at coronary care units and they looked at those who were we praying for and those who were not prayed for. And some of these studies you can follow up. I have some handouts later on that I will give you with 16 research that looks at all the health implications for prayer, for worship, for faith in God, and the different health conditions that your faith helps to uh, make a remarkable recovery. So you'll get that handout shortly, 16 uh, uh, research uh, evidence. I'm just choosing a few here. Now, we said first that prayer works for heart patients. But as you know, with every hypothesis and with every research, there'll be a further research that comes out which does what? Says the opposite. And so we have to present a balance because this workshop is about presenting the balance of evidence that shows that faith works. So we can't hide when another research comes up and says something different. We have to create a balance. Now, it's interesting, a later study at Duke University again found that the patients they were praying for who received intercessory prayer didn't have any dramatic results or differences. Sometimes that happens with research studies and we have to be big enough to be able to present both sets of evidence. Now, with research, what we have found is that while studies have reported the beneficial ev effects of faith and prayer, the most uh, convincing evidence-based reports are those for, phys for mental well-being. It's very difficult to be able to uh, substantiate a lot of the claims of physical healing for some of the physiological illnesses and show the evidence base. Only a few have been found, as we showed you, a few with cardiac patients. But the body of research point to those pa patients who have mental health illness and who have had a positive outcome from that. Now, going back to, I'll go back to the previous slide, um, on uh, the evidence of, of research. In 2007, 2000, let's see, when was it? 2008, my mother collapsed and was taken to hospital. And uh, she was found to have a grade three bleed. She had what we call an aneurysm, which is a, a, a blood vessel that burst in her head. And um, she had this huge bleed, it was a grade three. Now, when you have a, a hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage, and you go to hospital, they grade you as a grade one bleed, a grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five. So my mother was a grade three bleed, and she was in and out of consciousness. What did we do? We called the elders of the church, as James 5.16 tells us. They came to the hospital and anointed her with oil. And in, interesting, during the anointing, she came round a little bit, and she was quite lucid. And the pastors who were doing the anointing said to her, what do you want the Lord to do for you? Now, my mother was sort of coming in and out of consciousness. And amazingly, at the time of the anointing, she had recovered enough to be anointed and to know what was happening. And I was on the tip of my tongue to say that you'll be healed because I was really into, I want my mother to live. And she paused and she said that God's will would be done. So she had the anointing. The surgeons scheduled the day for her operation and for when she was to go down to surgery. So the morning came and we prayed with her as we usually do. And we had been praying all along as a family. So they're taking her to the operation, to have the operation. They were um, transferring her from the uh, bed onto the operation table. And she collapsed and had a second bleed. They had to take her off the operating table and bring her back to the ward. The doctors and surgeons met with us and said, now, your mother has had a second bleed. She came in with a grade three bleed. They then did a scan of the brain to show that when she came in, the ventricles were sort of about a third filled with blood in the brain. This time with the second bleed, it was two thirds full. They said she came in as a grade three bleed. She's now a grade four, grade five, which is inoperable. If we go in and operate, 
with her like that, she will die on the table because her brain would be so swollen and bloody, we won't be able to see what we're doing. It's a fresh bleed. But if we leave her, she will die because the chances of surviving a second bleed is minimal. In fact, they said, now she's had a second bleed, her chances of survival is 0.4%. Can you imagine being given a, a diagnosis of survival of 0.4%? That's like saying it's impossible for you to live. So they said to us, if we operate, it's, it's a fresh bleed, it's swollen and bloody, we don't know what to do. She will die on the table. If we leave her, she will die. What do you want us to do? Can you imagine? I was left with the decision as the one with the health background, and I was saying, my goodness, if we go ahead with the operation and she dies on the table, I will never forgive myself. But if we don't operate and she dies, I'll say, well, why didn't I do something about it? So they said, we know that you're Christians. We saw you praying and we heard you singing around the bed. You're... And it was amazing that they were observing us. And they said, I know you'd make the right decision. So we went ahead and we decided that we would pray. My sister sent me off because we were keeping a 13-hour vigil around her bed all the time because she was absolutely, completely comatose by this stage. When we had to leave the bedside for any reason to go to the bathroom or anything like that, we would put one of these headsets on which had a scripture healing tapes of scriptures and Bible passages so that even though she was subconscious or unconscious, we know that the power of God's word is powerful to heal. That's what we felt. So they sent me off. They said, Sharon, this is an emergency. We need to know immediately, do we take her to theater or do we leave her? Go and ring your uncle. So because one of my uncles has done brain surgery, he works in Canada. And so they says, he'll give us some good advice. So I went off. They went to another part of the hospital to keep praying, to keep the prayer visual going. I went to ring my uncle in, the, in uh, Canada at the time. And he gave me a few pointers. And he, first of all, he said, if they don't know what they're doing, don't let them touch her. I don't want my sister to die. But then they gave me some pointers of what to say. But as I was leaving uh, the phone call, I said, God, now my uncle has given me these questions to ask the consultant and to guide them. He is a surgeon. He's done all of this before, neurology, and my, he's, he's done a lot of specialisms. But I need to hear from you, God, whether we should go ahead with this surgery or not. And as I was leaving the phone booth in the hospital, the passage of scripture came to me, Chronicles, Second Chronicles, you know that scripture, where Jehoshaphat was going to battle. And uh, the, the uh, word from God says, you have no need to fight in this battle, for the battle is not yours, it's the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. That's the passage of scripture that came to me. And I said, yes, the Lord is saying in my heart to go ahead He's taken care of it. We've already prayed. We've done the anointing. So as I was leaving the booth and I was going along, my sisters were in the background. They, they were coming forward. And as we came, to, came close, I could see them smiling. And they said, Sharon, we've been praying and God has given us a word. We feel impressed that we've, God has given us a decision. What has God been saying to you? And we were going back and forth. And I said, well, what did God say to you? You've just finished praying. What has God said to you? Then they said to me, well, what has God said to you? What did uncle say? We went back and forth for a while. And then my sister said, you know, we just finished praying. And as we pray to ask God, should we go ahead with the operation or not? Second Chronicles came in came to us. You have no need to fight in this battle, for the battle is not yours, it's the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And so from two separate parts of the hospital, as we were praying in one area, I was on the phone to my uncle, we got the same passage of scripture, which confirmed, and we went ahead. Now, my mother had the operation. It was seven and a half, nearly eight hours operation. The surgeons came out and they said, now, we had to handle the brain far more than we needed to. And we feel that when your mother comes out of this, she's not going to be able to walk, to talk. In fact, it's likely she'll be a vegetable for the rest of her life because we had to handle the brain so much. It was a very difficult operation. We smiled and my sister said, you know, we believe in God. And yes, we thank you for your prognosis. I was there looking at all the data. Second bleed, 0.4 survival rate. The doctor's overhandling the brain. Of course, if you've had invasive brain surgery, it doesn't mean you're going to come out just the same as before. 
So the days went by, my mother couldn't recognize any of us. I would bring the albums in to see if she could recognize us. No speech, no walking, nothing. And one day she actually collapsed. And she was sitting in bed and she collapsed. We had to press the emergency alarm and the doctors came and she had to go back to theater because she developed hydrocephalus, which is fluid on the brain. They then had to put a shunt in which drained the, the fluid from the brain into the stomach so she had what they call a ventricular peritoneal shunt to drain off the fluid. Anyway, to cut a long testimony short, she was in there for 13 weeks and she was in the high dependency unit. In, we had 15 admissions in that time and 11 of those admissions died. Can you imagine, I was beginning to think, there's no way she's going to survive. She's going to be a vegetable. 11 people are dying around her who came in with less of a bleed than she did. But the word of God kept coming back. You've got to have faith in me. At week 13, when my mother was discharged, walking, talking, and praising God, it was an amazement to the medical practitioners. In fact, we decided that we were going to have a day of, uh, of celebration and praise to thank God for what they did. We invited the three remaining patients in that high dependency unit, the surgeons and the health professionals, to come to that celebration. Because, you know, when, when God does something special for you, and we've been praying all along and seeking medical aid, when the Lord does a miracle, we need to celebrate it in a big way, don't you think? So we invited the surgeons and the nurses and the remaining patients. At the Thanksgiving service, the surgeon who, who did the main operation, who couldn't be there, he wrote a letter which he read out. He said, what has happened to Mrs. Platt is beyond medicine. We have not done this. Now, this is a surgeon who's not a Christian. What has happened to Mrs. Platt is beyond medicine. We have not done this. And then they wrote, the faith of her children has saved her. Now, we know it wasn't our faith. What he's saying is a faith in God. Isn't that exciting when a medical practitioner can say, this was not us, this was God. Does faith work? Yes, it does. So the evidence is there, but with mental health, what they found is that people, the spiritual care and psychiatric uh, treatment team, in 2002 put out some uh, research and mental uh, mental illness and adulthood in 2004 found that patients who had a spiritual involvement and who had a religious background, their outcome was associated with more positive mental health outcomes because of their faith in God. Isn't that exciting? Medical practitioners are now saying faith in God works, especially for mental health. The Royal College of Psychiatrists, you can see there, discovered that mental health service users identified positive outcomes associated with good spiritual care. And they said it raised self-esteem and helped people to have better relationships. And that's mental health in 2005. Now, another study with people who had severe mental health problems across a range of diagnoses. This was a study that looked at Christians, people who had a faith, who succumbed to mental health illness, and they had a range of the neurosis and psychosis. And they found that 60% of the individuals reported that their religious experience and their spirituality was very helpful and had a great deal of a beneficial impact on their illness. So even with mental health illness, the outcome is enhanced when you have a faith. In 2006, mental health, religion, and culture looked at cultural groups and their outcomes, and the Mental Health Foundations found that one of the reasons these participants gave for their successful outcomes was that they, fe they felt cared for and nurtured because of their faith in God. And so in 2006, the Mental Health Foundation published the document, and they said that even people with, re with depression they're more likely to recover when they have this belief in God uh, because of the value and the support and the connectivity with God that they have. So even with conditions such as depression, uh, the outcomes were better. In 2008, a BBC documentary was done to look at the regions of the, uh, of the world where people lived better, longer, and lived more healthily. And they looked at Sardinia, and they looked at the Okinawans, and they looked at the Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda. So this particular program was aired in, in the UK. 
And when they looked at the Adventists attending one of our churches in Loma Linda, Dr. Kelly Morton tried to extrapolate some of the reasons why people of faith, particularly Seventh-day Adventists, did well. And they said it was something to do with our resilience to life stressors. When we have stressors, we don't uh, despair in the same way. So the impact of stress doesn't have the same profound negative impact as someone who doesn't have a faith. And Dr. Kelly Morton says this, there are many stressors in life that we cannot control. Connection to something higher than oneself, connection to the sacred, connection to a tight-knit religious community allows you to modulate your actions, your reactions, your emotions, to believe that there's a broader purpose and therefore your body can stay in balance and not be destroyed by those stressors and traumas over time. And isn't it interesting that the Bible text says that when we are under heavy temptation and trials, the Lord will make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. And we know that our faith can give us that durability. So there are many positive things about faith. Haven't we seen how faith can help with our physical well-being and our mental well-being? But what happens when our faith conflicts? Do you believe that sometimes our faith can be conflicting? Believe that there can be adverse outcomes. I attended a conference recently. I belong to the National BAME or Black Asian Minority Ethnic Group. Transplant Alliance is a national body looking at uh, people of color who uh, have issues with organ donation. So we know that uh, a number of people from certain uh, cultural groups have hypertension, diabetes, and these can uh, predispose to things like renal failure. And so we have a higher need amongst certain populations in the UK for organ donations, but because people don't give their organs from these ethnic groups, it's very unlikely to have a match. But the research was done that found, this is at the conference, a health professional made this statement about religious individuals in the UK, and they said this, religious beliefs and practice amongst some cultural groups in the United Kingdom may preclude individuals from making health choices that are deemed by medical professionals to be advantageous to their health. And this is the research that he found from the public health. A public health document was looked at to look at sometimes our faith can cause us to go in the opposite direction and be very extreme. And this is what the public health document on spirituality, religion, and health beliefs said. Migrants to the UK, I'm giving some examples from where I come from. It says here, migrants to the UK have a diverse range of beliefs and health providers. Health providers should be aware of the role and impact of, spiritual, of the spiritual and religious beliefs in the person's life and the impact on their health. It is good practice to explore with all patients for whom you are prescribing medication whether anything religious, requirements, or indeed any other factor might interfere with their ability to comply with your recommendations. Now, you might say that our Adventist faith, we don't say don't have blood transfusion or don't take medication. There's nothing in our, doc in our doctrines that precludes us from medical intervention. However, there is a growing body, a small body in our church who feels you mustn't have medication. You should just deal with uh, herbs. And when they go to hospitals, they say, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't believe in medicine. We have had children who have gone to hospital who refused, the parents refused treatment and the child has declined. In the United Kingdom, if that happens and somebody because of a religious affiliation feels that I don't believe in medicine, I'm not going to give my child this medication, in the United Kingdom, that comes under neglect and child abuse and social services does step in. And that has happened to some of our Adventists who have the extreme view not to include medication. Now, this is what the public health said. Be aware that religious belief may affect the acceptability of aspects of medical care, diagnostic processes, and certain types of treatment, and also of the potential impact of religious observance uh, uh, on treatment. Now, sometimes with the Muslims, when they're going through the fasting, they can't take medication, some of them who are extreme. 
You'll say that doesn't happen in Adventism. But I know when I was nursing some people on the ward, they were saying, I'm fasting today, I can't have any medication. Or they will have some extreme views. So as a church, we may not have these extreme views, but we need to remember that we have to encourage some of our members who may refuse treatment. We, in the case studies we will do after the break, you will see that some individuals who... Uh, are, are at the extreme stages of cancer who may have been offered chemotherapy or radiotherapy will say, I don't want it, or refuse it for their children who subsequently die. What do we do with those areas of conflict? So later on, we're going to do, I want you to think about what are the current issues or challenges you face within your churches in regard to the health messages. As we go through this workshop, what are the extreme examples in your churches that, you know, some people say you mustn't have certain things? What are those extremes? What dietary rules and, and principles are they saying that this is related to your spirituality? Yes? What are some of the extremes and what do you do, do about it? And I suggest that where areas of conflict arise in these areas, we're going to talk about that later on, dealing with conflict. We need to make sure that this is covered in prayer, that we approach the Lord and ask for wisdom. But go to counseling for those who have a balanced view and ask God how to deal with these issues because sometimes it can split the church. Where you have, recently I went to a church for lunch and lunchtime is supposed to be a nice social event, isn't it? Your potluck lunch. So here I was sitting at this table, potluck lunch, and they had a newly baptized member sitting at the table, and they had another lady who was a visitor to the Adventist church. So everybody put out their lunch on the table, and we were having a nice social engagement after the sermon. You digest your food well when there's a nice, pleasant atmosphere. When all of a sudden, one of our older ladies, Adventist ladies, who'd been an Adventist for years, peered over into the, our plates and began to do a police inspection of the food, deciding what was good and what wasn't. And everybody who, on her plate was a raw meal. She had a big plate of raw food. And she was saying, now this is what we should be doing. The more raw food we have, we can hear the spirit more. We're more in touch with God when we have the raw food. Now, the newly baptized member was there and the visitor to the church. And she looked at her plate and she looked at the other lady's place and she said, well, I guess I'm not getting to heaven then. How sad, yes? And so some of these views can split the church. In fact, now there's a whole new move. If you're not on raw meals, you're not holy, yes? That is the, so some of this can uh, 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 cause some problems. Now in the, in the British Union, I've had to put a strategy together because we do have extreme groups who are going outside and uh, later on you'll hear about it some groups aren't in the church are not satisfied with your normal anointing services. We must have a healing conference. They're watching some of these channels in, in the United Kingdom. We have some channels called God Channels. And you see a lot of the Pentecostal programs and the charismatic programs. And they're saying, oh, the little anointing at home is not working. We must have a healing service where we just pray over everyone. Yes, you know, like those big charismatics. Some of you have those views. Others have the views that we must just have the herbs and the, the medicine from God's gardens. And so I've had to put some guidelines together. And what we w wanted to do is uh, in your churches where there are these divergent views where people saying no chemotherapy, no radiotherapy, only raw food, you must just be on juices. We had one sister who was called a fruitarian. She was saying vegetables came in after sin. You mustn't have vegetables. You must be on fruits because that was the original diet. Have you heard of the original diet? People say original diet. You're not religious enough. You're having vegetables. It came in after sin. And I'm a fruitarian. And when you looked at her, I was wondering which fruit she looked like. She was so thin. And, uh, but that was not very uh, 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 kind. But I've had to put some guidelines. And uh, we need to look at guidelines to encourage evidence-based practice. We had some individuals who were now doing uh, magnet therapy, cranial, various therapy, urine therapy, uh, all of those reflexology, a whole range of therapies that they wanted to do at a health expo. We said no. 
the general conference has issued, the general conference health ministry department has issued a list of medicine, um, of, of therapies, alternative therapies that they say to, uh, conflicts with our Adventist beliefs. You need to get that document. And so you should be having the uh, Irish therapy and all the magnet therapy and all of these strange uh, new age. The health ministry's general conference has a list of the alternative therapies that are not evidence-based. So if anyone is doing programs in your churches, you need to know whether they're going to bring that in, reflexology and all of these other ones. So it's to encourage evidence-based practice. The other bit of my guidelines is to safeguard people, health practices, and health-related programs in the British Union Conference. We want to present a balanced message in regards to faith, health, belief, and practice. But we also want to train individuals in the safe and effective use of natural medicine. God's pharmacy is effective. And we don't want to say natural medicine isn't effective. It is, but we need to get the balance. And we're going to look at how we're going to do that. So the BC guidelines, it's a church protocol. You need to look at, if you don't have one, a church protocol to invited um, guests. Now, when people come to your church to present a health program, you need to know ahead of time what they're going to present. Because we've had people who come to our church, we've had one train in a particular church where people came from abroad and they said, now, if you have a boil or a tumor, I will cut it and let the tumor drain and stitch it up and your cancer will go. We've had people come from another country and got people and they were paying 300 pounds, 400 pounds, 500 pounds for the courses. We didn't know they had come into the, into the union. So you have to safeguard uh, people coming into your territory. The church board is responsible for enacting the protocol. Every church, if you're having a visiting speaker, would have a protocol of how to invite the speaker, what to look for to make sure they're endorsed by your conference. Additionally, there needs to be some health programs. Whenever you have health programs, the Adventist Risk Management needs to know about your health programs and what you're, in, you're doing to ensure that if your practitioners are doing massage, they're accredited masseurs and that they will give out a sheet saying, I haven't had a shoulder operation or a broken limb or something like that. Because if you're going to give a massage, you have to take the, patient, the visitor through a whole checklist before you even touch them. We have to follow certain guidelines so when we do our programs, if something go wrong, the church cannot be sued. We have to be balanced. So we have this protocol. So we check first with the conference director that the person who's going to speak is endorsed, that you know about them, that you know what the program is going to run. If they are a health professional that doesn't have an accredited professional a qualification, that team needs to work with a doctor on their team so someone has an evidence-based uh, outcome so that they can assess it. You need to request evidence of accredited specialist training. So someone can't get up in your church and say, I have a health presentation to do today. I'm going to speak. And you don't know if they're accredited or they're a health professional. You need to know what their, cred their credentials and qualifications are. In the United Kingdom, we have a lot of health evangelism courses. And we know that medical missionary work is, is in fact advancing. However, we have a clear guideline in the British Union Conference that the health evangelism courses are excellent, four weeks, however many weeks. But after the completion of the course, of the health evangelism course, it doesn't make that an individual an, an immediate consultant or practitioner. Because sometimes people say, I'm a, medical, uh, I'm a medical missionary, and they go off and start treatment in their home and get members to come. That is not, that's risk, that you open yourself to risk. And they'll say, oh, the Lord gave me a vision. I have faith to move ahead that I'm a medical missionary. And they're not accredited. So we have to get the balance to safeguard our members. So we're going to look at those uh, uh, shortly. This is my second to last slide. Safeguarding members. When somebody comes up with a healing testimony now, I know that God can heal. I gave you an example of my mother who had two types of brain hemorrhage. One was a subarachnoid hemorrhage, was a grade three bleed. Uh, well, well, firstly, she had the aneurysm. Then she had the second bleed. 
medical evidence that she could have died. When a healing, and my mother has been healed, the doctor said it himself, so I know that there's healing. When our members come up to give a healing testimony, you need to ask them first to tell you what they're going to say. Now, that sounds very draconian and very over the top, but I've had programs where I invited people to come up and give uh, another member a testimony of healing, and they came out with some very strange things about what God told them to do, and they breathed out the cancer and all sorts of very strange things. And it was videoed, it was recorded. When a member comes to give a healing testimony, you, and it's in a public setting, you need to say, oh, that's wonderful, I'm glad to hear that God is healing. Can you share with me what happens so you can hear what they're going to say? Secondly, any reports of healing must be accompanied by verification. So they need to say, here is the letter that says I no longer have cancer, or here is the GP consultant told me that I'm now cured. We don't want to go and look at everybody's blood results and be nosy and be prying in people's personal uh, uh, data, but we need to be able to verify that this is a true healing because we've had several people in our congregations who've died of cancer who said, I'm healed, I'm going to destroy my medication. They went to the bathroom and flushed the toilet, throw away their medicine, and they subsequently died because they said, oh, God told me I'm healed. There was no verification from the medical practitioners. So we need to have a balance. And we know that God is a divine healer and that he can do all things when we trust in him. But we need that balance. He says, come to me and I will heal you. But I've also given uh, individuals research and the intelligence and the wisdom. And that's what we're going to be discussing. Mm -hmm.